Thanks very much, Malcolm. Um, I'm just going to share some slides uh, that I'll talk through. Um, just bear with me one second while I get that up. Okay, so first of all, um, I want to thank everyone for joining. Um, because this project uh, that I've completed and I'm about to share with you, that's called Only for Freedom, it was made partly to commemorate or coincide with the decoration of our broth, whose anniversary fell on Monday, the 6th of April, just gone. And I was going to have an exhibition of the work and uh, it obviously got cancelled for, for obvious reasons. So it's really fantastic that Street Level have uh, organised this virtual exhibition and, and talk. So I really appreciate that and absolutely appreciate your time and you, you guys that are out there in Facebook land joining uh, to spend some time and look at the work. So as Malcolm said, I'm going to talk for 20 minutes. Don't worry, I've set my alarm uh, that will go off to warn me uh, not to talk too long. I've literally got 12 sort of images that I'm going to share with you in a little slideshow and just talk as I go through the images. So what you're looking at right now on the screen, hopefully, if the technology is working, is in a way where it all started. So um, one of the things, you know, Malcolm talked about all this stuff that I've done, but, uh, you know, when I was a young guy, you know, 18, I went to uni, I actually studied medieval history. So, you know, art and photography and all that came much later in life. Um, but I've always been interested in it and I've always been really interested in history. So when I went to art school at the grand old age of 46, that was in 2010, I realised that the time that I would graduate uh, from art school would be June 2014. And it got me thinking that mm, there's an interesting date falls in June 2014, and that's the 700th anniversary of the Battle of Bannockburn. Now, you know, I'm sure most of the people on line right now watching this will realise that that was a fairly fundamental point in the wars of Scottish independence back in the medieval times and by other chance and coincidence there was that year going to be a referendum on independence that would fall in September so you know very early in my course at, at uh, fine art photography at the art school I decided I wanted to do a project about Bannockburn and I spent three years um, going to the site of the battle and making images and Lots of them were fairly conventional, but I decided that I wanted to do something that would capture time in a way in that place and wasn't necessarily a representative image of what was there in terms of landscape. And so I fell on this process. It was called solar graphy. So what you do in making a solar graph is you make a pinhole camera. In my case, I use Pringles pots, simple, um, effective and I fill it up with black and white photographic paper. And over time, through the pinhole, the sun scores marks into the paper. And I just felt there was something about that abstraction. Uh, one thing that you could say uh, is relatively unchanging in a place over a period of time, as long as 700 years, is the sun itself, you know, that I won't start getting into all the deep philosophical stuff, but, uh, you know, it, it just spoke to me uh, and the sense of history I wanted to lay down. Because when I got into that place and started working there, the thing that really struck me wasn't so much connotations with nationalism and the, 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 the you know, the search for independence, actually, it was more... I was struck by the feeling I got when I went to that place about the fact that more people had died there in that spot on a single day in our history than have died on any other day in Scottish history. 
So there was a lot to it. And uh, I started making these, these types of images as a way of, you know, an abstract way of giving some expression to that. So uh, the reason, and I will move on because I realise I'm, I'm taking time over it, but uh, yeah, why, why this is important uh, and why I'm really grateful we're doing this chat right now is because the exhibition I spent three years on from a degree show never happened because in the end there was a fire. So though that, that work for Bannockburn was just never seen. Um, and I was fearful that having come on to, you know, make work that coincides with the 700th anniversary of the Declaration of our Broth, that, my God, the same thing was going to happen. It was going to be, you know, another body of work that had been made fairly painstakingly that would never be seen. But you're here and it's going to be seen. So that's fantastic. So moving on. Um, immediately after graduation and then the referendum came around, um, I was really struck by after the rever referendum had taken place in September that the, I thought there would be a sense of resolution, whether you were somebody who voted yes or somebody that voted no. I thought that at least the decision would finally be made after this period of fervent debate and that things would settle down. But as I'm sure many of you will remember, there was just this real sense of irresolution. It was though the country was still pregnant with change in a way. And I decided I wanted to make some work about that and wanted to lean on the experience that I'd had with making those solar graphs. And so I traveled to the 45 most populous cities and towns of Scotland and made this series that was called 45 Sun Pictures in Scotland. And what you're looking at right now is a picture of Arbroath. Um, if you look very closely under the dark blue sun rays, you will see that there is a, actually the cathedral, or the, sorry, the abbey, the Arbroath Abbey. And there's a kind of rose, circular rose window up high on the tower. So already as I made that series, there was occasions when I would be drawn to these sites um, within those towns that were most populous, that were in some way related to, again, the history of the wars of independence. So there was a little kind of germ, germ of an idea forming. The other th thing that happened that was significant when I made that series is I actually got a map of Scotland that was a touring map. And the north of the country was on one side and the south of the country was on the other. And I put little stickers on there to the 45 places that were the most populous and where I was going to go and make some of these pictures. Now, it struck me quite strongly when I did that, that on the north side of the map, there were only four stickers or four locations that were of the 45 most populous. And all the other uh, locations were on the, the southern side of the map. And it just kind of brought it home to me about the, the huge imbalance in the distribution of population within Scotland. And it kind of stuck at the back of my mind that if I ever made another work or series that was around this theme, that I wanted to find a way to redress that balance in terms of the geographic coverage that I was making. <clears throat> Mark, Malcolm alluded to another series that I did soon after that, and that was... Um, one where I was making more conventional pictures in a way of scenes around Scotland that had some significance to me. And I made them into a set of printed postcards. And I started off by, you know, when I was making the pictures, putting text on the front. So it would always be a little line of text that somehow revealed something unseen in the picture. So... In this case, um, when you look at the picture, what strikes you immediately is, oh, it's a lighthouse, yeah? But if you look at the rock formations around that lighthouse, those are not natural rock formations. What you're actually looking at is the ruins of a medieval castle. And in fact, if you read the, te the text at the bottom there, it says uh, Turnberry Castle, 
uh, ruin, uh, Robert Bruce's childhood home, and now on a Donald Trump golf course, because that's where it is. So, you know, the, the, the idea was to take these um, images of Scotland and landmarks, and when I eventually printed them up as postcards, uh, the text came off of the, the front of the picture, and I would print it on the back of the postcard. So in this case, you know, you're looking at Dune Ray, the old nuclear power station up in Caith Ness. On the back, it, it just says a little one-liner, um, being, uh, you know, deconstructed since 1998. So, you know, what you're looking at is the, the site today for the last 20 odd years um, it's been decommissioned because that's how long it takes to deal with the aftermath of uh, nuclear energy. So there were little subtle observations about things like energy and, you know, the the, the economy uh, that we have in the country and how it's how it's changing over time. Now we get to the meat of um, what I wanted to talk about, and that's the sun pictures in Scotland. So, um, so you know, that's the, it's, sorry, the, the new series only for freedom, and I've got eight eight pictures here that I'm going to fly through. Um, what you're looking at there is Quendale in Shetland, of all places. Um, I just wanted to make the point that this was a fairly epic journey, uh, made not not once but twice. So coming to do this series um, that referred to our growth, I wanted to redress that geographic balance that I spoke about. So what I decided to do was visit all 32 council areas of Scotland and make these solograph images. And um, this one, as I said, was made in Shetland. And the other seven I'm going to fly through now are ones where there's a reference to the Wars of Independence. So the next one is Schoon, where up in Perth and Kinross, where Robert Bruce was crowned in 1306. He then had was defeated in battle and had to flee the country, probably hiding out on Rathlin, Rathlin Island, um, just off the, nor the coast of North Northern Ireland. Um, this is Loudon Hill that you're looking at now, which is in Ayrshire. And this is where he fought his first successful battle upon return to Scotland in 1307. And now this is another way of looking at Bannockburn uh, in Stirlingshire the, that I made uh, there. This one, obviously the battle was fought in 1314. Um, the reason why this is completely different from the very first image you saw in the presentation is that this is a negative and the first one you saw was a positive. Remembering, of course, these are black and white photographic paper images. This is what happens when you expose black and white paper to intense light. And if you reverse the colours, make it into a positive image, the dark lines become yellow and the lighter areas become a kind of bluish or greenish hue. This is a picture of Dunbar, which if you know the song Flower of Scotland and sent him homeward to think again, well, in the Battle of Bannockburn, uh, King Edward II fled the battlefield to a safe house, if you like, Dunbar Castle. And from there, he caught a ship homeward to think again. This here uh, is another view of Varbroth, uh, where in 1320, there was a letter effectively drafted on behalf of the barons of Scotland that went to the Pope in Avignon. And it was a plea for his intercession to effectively call off uh, the English who had been harassing Scotland. They'd never accepted Scotland's independence, even after the devastating loss at the Battle of Bannockburn. Now, this is a picture of Portobello. And you might be asking yourself, why is there a picture of Portobello, Edinburgh? Um, in this series uh, and what's its relevance to medieval history as well. Well, the date when we finally did have the English accept Scottish independence was 1328, 
the year before Bruce actually died, there was a, a treaty signed with the new king of uh, England, Edward III. And in that Treaty of Edinburgh, Northampton, um, it was recognised that the, Bruce was the rightful king and Scotland was free and independent of English sovereignty. Um, so hence the image taken from Edinburgh. And then lastly, um, here's one of Melrose and the Scottish borders. Uh, so we've gone on a journey from Shetland to the borders. And this is a place where after Bruce died, um, his, his body was buried in Dunfermline Abbey, um, but his heart was taken by his right-hand man, um, Douglas, who took it on pilgrimage to, well, I say pilgrimage, he was actually going on a crusade uh, because the idea was that he would take Bruce's heart to the Holy Land in a kind of, you know, penance, if you will. He'd been excommunicated, he'd promised to go on crusade, didn't live long enough to do it, so he wanted his heart to be taken there and it's in, in, in his stead. Unfortunately, Douglas got killed in Spain and the heart was taken back and buried at Melrose Abbey. So we've gone full circle from the very top of Scotland to near the bottom. And I think that's probably a good place uh, to stop. I don't know how long I've spoken for, John. If I can, you know, I could go on longer. Um, but I guess I'll go until the alarm sounds. Um, so I guess the a few things to say about the series in summary. Um, for me, you know, this whole tracking of medieval history is just uh, it's just like a storyline to follow, a way of making the journey. Um, the real point of it all for me is to, I guess, start a conversation that's about independence and what kind of country, that was the alarm, <laughs> what kind of country it is that Scotland is and what kind of country it might become if it were independent. Those are the things that I think about and the process of making these pictures, um, which are obviously very abstract, for me is a, is, a, is a journey of investigation and trying to learn new things about about this, this place, this country, and the potential that it has as, as a nation. I think I'll end it there and uh, maybe take some questions. Malcolm. Thanks very much, Frank. That was fascinating. Uh, wonderful presentation as well. So, yeah, they are very abstract. There's a lot of ideas behind them. Um, could we say that this is really quite conceptual work, uh, bearing in mind that con conceptualism is really all about ideas? But this is kind of process-based, time-based almost, the way that, it's, that you go about it. Um, is that something that's conscious in your mind about the way that you you do it, the whole process? Yeah, do you know it's funny? Like, um, it comes from what you've done in the past. You know that you know, one thing follows another. When I made those images way back, in sort of art school, um, nearly ten years ago, um, I was kind of obsessed with the idea of compressing time, and that's why I fell upon this process of solar graphy um but that that was so it was it was um process driven at the outset but then as you say it becomes more conceptual as you move on and you start to learn things so you know i read a lot after that okay so i stumbled upon the process because of, i had a problem i wanted to solve and that was how to compress time yeah um and think about history in the long durée rather than taking a snapshot of an event that was happening. Um, so that was the start of it. But then, of course, I go and I start reading about theories of abstraction and the history of abstraction in photography. And really there's three, I guess, strands that run through that. You know, in the beginning, you had guys like Talbot um, photographing under a microscope uh, insect wings. Now, if you can imagine in the 1840s, a person looking at a piece of paper that was 10 inches 
high and seeing these wings, they would have they would have not been a, an incredibly fascinating for thing them to do. They might not have even recognised what they were looking at because it's a familiar thing photographed in an unfamiliar way. Yeah, um, so that's a form of abstraction that's that's gone consistently from the beginning of photography, and then you've got. Um, Photog photography that's really of that's process based that's of the medium itself and you have fantastic exponents of that to this day people like um wolfgang timmermans you know he's he's more famous for his um realistic images but he does all these wonderful abstractions that are based on the photographic process itself and then thirdly the you have conceptual abstraction which starts off with guys like Mel Bochner and runs today to people like Idris Khan, who take conceptual ideas and to give them form, they find ways of making abstract images. So Idris Khan would do things like photograph every, every single page of Camera Lucida, and then superimpose those images onto one another. So you're looking at a single image of that book and its contents, yeah? so. If you look across those three strands in the history of abstraction and photography, I think that um, what I'm doing is almost an amalgam of those those three things. It doesn't fit neatly into any single category. There's elements of all of that in what I'm doing. Yeah. Sorry, I, I, I went on a bit there. No, that, that's a very good explanation of uh, what it is you're doing. But you mentioned Fox Talbot. And yeah. you referenced uh, him in a previous post about him. He did the first ever photo book, in your opinion, yeah. that had a Scottish theme or content to it. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so, I mean, I think we all know and accept that, quite rightly, that the first ever uh, photo book was, in fact, Anna Atkins' uh, Book of Cyanotypes, which are all about British algae. Um, so seaweed, <laughs> for want of a better word. Um, but Fox Talbot often gets credited with making the first true photo book that's of you know the world uh, and its surroundings, and that's the pencil of nature. But in fact, that was a serialization. It was never published as a, a full book until uh, after the publication of his. Uh, other work, Sun Pictures in Scotland, where he came to Scotland in the late, sorry, the, the, the early 40s, I think it was like 1843, 18, uh, 1844, and he photographed sites that were associated with Sir Walter Scott, um, including the, the Scott Memorial in Edinburgh, including Loch Catron, um, where some of Walter Scott's novels were set, and they then published the book in 1845. So it's kind of, in my view, uh, his first published work and one of the first photo books ever was in fact, Sun Pictures in Scotland, a book of Scottish landscape photographs. And only later did Pencil of Nature actually get completed. Um, so in that, in that, I find very interesting uh, when you look at, again, the whole history of, of photography itself as a medium that has its roots in this country. Mm. Okay, yeah, very good. Now, a bit of a glib question here. Uh, the Outlaw King, how well do you think that kind of represented or told a certain story? There's this kind of fascinating thing about how Scotland is portrayed yeah. through other types of cultural yeah. forms like Hollywood. We've had Braveheart yeah. way yeah. prior to that. We had uh, uh, Brigadoon and such like. I mean, how does how does um, the Outlaw King fare to you in terms of... Uh, yeah. this, is, this, is really gonna, this is really going to show me up because <laughs> I've, never, I've never watched never the Outlaw King. It. No, it's yeah. not my thing. Uh, you know, I did years ago watch Braveheart and yeah. it was just laughable to me because there's guys running around in kilts and the kilts is an 18th century invention of a an english foundry um manager um so to me it was just crass but 
from what I've heard, the Outlaw King is not as nearly as bad as that. Um, yeah. But look, I mean, as a general question, it doesn't actually matter if I've watched that specific film or not. I think that, um, it, you know, in popular culture, um, these things that entertain that are loosely based on historical fact, at least they, they generate discussion and debate and give an opportunity for people to become curious about what the true facts are and go and do their own investigation. So to me, it's a good thing. And maybe I will go and watch it now, uh, now that you've put me on the spot like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the Declaration of Our Growth itself, right? A lot of yes. people just, what is the Declaration of Our Growth? That's one question. Yeah. What does it mean now in relation to our contemporary predicament? Yeah. Um, but also, so a third question, uh -huh. in a way, is for those who do know what it is, it's often misrepresented as being a very kind of quotable document, which is often used to, or it's misinterpreted as being yeah. anti English. Right. What do you say about that? Okay, well, the first thing to say about that is that probably my, my English uh, wife, Belinda, is sat in the next room, uh, and my two English born sons are probably, you know, hopefully uh, got, got it on their iPad as well. Um, so there's not an anti English bone in my body. And um, I think that it would be really wrong to view that document as an expression of anti-Englishness, right? You, yeah, I mean, you have to understand the way in which those documents were written. There's almost a consistent formula for the way you write them. The first thing that you do is you lay out your grievance. And in that time, in that case, uh, the aggressor, as it was perceived, were the English who kept invading and plundering and attacking. And, you know, the document actually lists effectively, a number of terrorist atrocities is how we would talk about it in today's parlance, yeah? But that's just a, a precy for getting the Pope, this figure of authority, to assist uh, in the way that the, the Scots uh, leaders at that time wanted. And, and that's like one thing you have to realise, there's a lot of stuff made about, well, this was a, a really democratic document um, that represented the whole people of Scotland. But really, honestly, um, the people that most represented were the ruling class um, who, you know, felt threatened and wanted to solidify their newly won power um, af after the Battle of Bannockburn. Um, and after effectively a civil war as well, because the rightful king uh, in law was a guy named John Balliol, and he'd been deposed. Um, but what, what is the document? What's in it? Um, firstly, as I've alluded to, it's an appeal to authority, the Pope uh, in Avignon, to um, intercede and call off the English. Um, but it's also a deal. It's an offer. They say, the barons of Scotland, if you call off the English, what we'll do in return is we'll go and answer your call to go and crusade and we'll go to the Holy Land and fight all these Muslims. Okay, so that's a bit you don't often hear about, um, but actually that's probably the central ask in the, in the Declaration of a Growth. Mm. But why is it remembered? Well, I think that the reason for it, it being so remembered and hallowed in today's uh, times still is it is and it gets me as well, it is this really moving expression of the desire for freedom and independence. I mean, it just really comes across as this heartfelt, poetic expression of that, that, that longing for, would you just leave us alone and let us get on with running our own country in our own way, yeah? And it draws on classical texts, the, the famous passage for, for freedom alone, is actually plagiarised from uh, a Roman author, Sallust's uh, work, um, the Catiline War. And 
in that original version, the Latin version of, you know, second century or whatever, the words aren't for freedom alone. The words are only for freedom, hence the title of the, the, the project that I've worked on. Um, so, yeah, I think it's still relevant today because that desire for freedom is timeless to me. The Romans had it, the medieval Scots had it, and I hope we have it too. So it's framed within, um, it's really a kind of European context back in those days, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not about necessarily Scotland and England, although it was in terms of uh, the wars that were going on in the oppression. Well, no, not really. I mean, it's, it's funny you should mention that because if you think about a battle like Bannockburn, it's a freaking international conflict, right? You know, there's Irish on both sides, there's Scots on both sides. There's thousands of Welshmen under the tutelage of an, a Welsh-born king, Edward II. And there's hundreds, if not thousands, of Gascons from France. So even in even in the wars of independence, um, it's difficult to think of it. Um, yeah, although politically it's Scotland versus England, dynastically it's a bit more than that, you know. So guys like Robert the Bruce, sure his first language might have been Gaelic because he grew up in Ayrshire, uh, which was uh, Gaelic speaking at that time. But he would have also spoken French and English and maybe a bit of Latin as well. Yeah. Okay. But what relevance is it now? I mean, the whole context of Brexit has kind of been eclipsed, obviously, because of the uh, coronavirus uh, situation. But how effective or relevant is that discussion now, Frank, from your, from your point of view? The Brexit discussion. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how it's become silenced with coronavirus. Um, but my view of this whole situation with coronavirus is it's, it's really interesting. I, I actually don't think that we can return to the status quo. I think that the massive intervention of governments um, to try and sort out this mess is something that was necessary whether we like it or not. But it's also counterintuitive in a way because some of the most right-wing <laughs> neoliberal governments you can think of who you know, would always profess to be 100% against state intervention have been forced into a situation where they are stopping the economy from running and hurting the people that profit from the, the economy the most. Um, but it also sets in the mind of the populace, you know, the demos. Um, actually, you know what? If we want to stand the economy on its head, if we want to do things differently, if we want to tackle things, que big questions like global warming, climate change, it must be possible. We've just proved it with this um, resistance and organised um, campaign to stop COVID from spreading. From, from spreading. So it's really interesting times that we're, we're living in. And, and I, I'll be very curious to see how they pick back up the, the whole Brexit um, agenda when things die down, which touch with they, they will quite soon. But I don't think they can re go back to it and pick up the pieces as though nothing has changed or nothing has happened. Yeah. Too true. Well, thank you, Frank. I think I'm going to pass over to uh, my colleague John now, who may have selected a few questions. I mean, to me, they're political images, but um, you, you know, I'm not the judge. Uh, I think that the viewer has to make up their own mind. Um, I think that if you'd viewed these ex if you'd viewed these images in an exhibition, you would you would obviously, or I would hope that you would see them with titles, so that you'd be able to 
make some kind of relationship between these abstract things you're looking at and if you like a historical narrative okay because there's enough there'll be enough in the titles for you to pick up quite quickly the connection back to the wars of independence um i've probably forgotten the first part of the question though that, that's the only problem um did you was there I don't know if that answers it. Style history with abstraction. There was yeah. three questions on the one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was more than one question. Yeah, reconciling yeah. history with abstraction. I mean, history, um, history is a narrative, um, and abstraction is quite. With abstraction, you're not necessarily telling, uh, telling us. You're not necessarily telling a story. You're trying to evoke some kind of response on a more emotional and visceral level. So it, it's up to you whether it works or not. But as I say, if you contextualize using titles, I think that that allows you to build the connections. So, yeah, it's a good question because um, history, um, which is, is narratively driven, um, wouldn't logically sit well with something that's completely abstract. Uh, hence, I think the need you have to contextualize it. Okay. Anything else there, John? Anything coming through from the audience? That's an interesting question. And I would say that the, you know, when, if you study history, you get taught, um, there's something called primary sources and then another called secondary sources. So a primary source would be a document like the Declaration of Our Broth itself. And I would recommend to anyone that they go and read the English translation of that. It's actually quite a short document unlike say the, the Act of Union of 1707, which is a bit longer, but um, you know, it, it, it's like a page long uh, and it's fascinating to read those original source documents. Um, but I, I've got to admit one of my favorite historians is probably the most popular Scottish historian. And that's Tom Devine, who has written a trilogy on Scottish history from uh, that's that's the modern period. So he's written a, a history that starts in, with the Act of Union in 1707 up to present times um, and two other volumes that go with that. One on the Scottish diaspora, um, you know, people from this country spreading around the world and what what the story of what happened with that, but also then directly looking at Scotland's role in imperialism um that that's the third volume so uh taken together they they give a fantastic overview of scottish history not just rooted in the the land we live in but um influence and impact negative or positive on the rest of the world okay um so john if it's okay with you i'll just read uh, the next question if that's agreeable um, well, Dave Ferry um, is asking, <laughs> do you think another independence vote will happen in the next couple of years? And uh, do you have a project in mind if it does? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, trust Dave. <laughs> yes, he's um, a troublemaker, isn't he? <laughs> so, I mean, it's, a re it's interesting for two reasons. Um, both Because it's, it's, there's two parts to that question. First part, this series, Only for Freedom, actually began as a kind of knee-jerk gut reaction to the fact that the Conservative Party were making statements to the effect that we will not allow a second referendum. And I just thought, this is so depressing. I have to do something about this that's positive in a way. And that's when this work began. So it was... It was um, as a reaction to that small mindedness that, you know, we're not even going to let you to just make a, a, a referendum about your own future. Um, so, yes, I do think that there will be another referendum, but obviously I can't say when that will be. 
Um, but I, I don't think it will go away. I think there will be one. And then the second part of the question was, if it comes around again, would I make another series? Well, I've been thinking about this. Um, you know, I think that I have this, uh, this weird idea that these projects, the two projects in particular, 45 Sun Pictures and Only for Freedom, it's almost like the art or the work is the journey that I make that, that act, it's almost like an act of rebellion. Uh, you know, I get so cheesed off that I have to do something with myself and I go on and make the journey and the pictures are just the evidence that remains at the end of it. But if I could articulate it uh, in a strange way, it's like I'm casting a spell. You know, I'm trying to, it's like an act of wish fulfillment. If I do this, then maybe the chances of independence will somehow be increased, right? But two is an odd number if you're going to cast spells. I don't know why I think that, but I think there has to be a third spell. And when I've cast a third spell, we're going to become independent. Okay. So there's a few more questions in. Um, I would say that you've partly answered one or two of them, but just to acknowledge, uh, Michael Stewart asked, uh, what way do you find history what way you find history is part of your roots between past and present into your project. I think you've maybe discussed that a little bit. Mm. Just part that uh, for now, Frank. Mm -hmm. um, David Buchanan uh, asking why you chose Portobello to represent Edinburgh when there are more obvious historical sites. So you've probably got a specific answer to that. So could you park that one as well? Yeah. Um, there's another couple of questions about process we'll, we'll come back to. So if you want to yeah. respond to that, Frank, yeah? The Portobello one is funny, right? So, right, <clears throat> the Edinburgh-Northampton Treaty, right? Uh, I don't know where in Edinburgh that treaty was signed, okay? Uh, so I could have chosen anywhere in Edinburgh. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. but. Portobello, it's like uh, just a, a place that's away from the centre of town. When you're putting up these cameras, um, you think about where you can put them that won't get noticed and they won't get taken down um, by, by young kids or whatever. And um, so that's that's a kind of out of the way place by the, the, sh the shoreline of the, the fourth. But it's also as some of you will know, a place that's got strong connections to um, the history of photography in Scotland. Um, some relatively well-known photographers have uh, had studios down there. Um, obviously, Alessia Bruce, uh, who comes to street level sometimes. I don't know if she'll be watching, but uh, I think she, she, she still does her photography down there as well. Okay. Um Sylvia Grace Borda, who's uh, somewhere ooh, in the Atlantic coast, somewhere, I think, Sylvia, has asked about the process, talking about so the actual yep. images, the process of doing it. So does, uh, so does Colin Gray. How long are the exposures? Now, you do talk about that to some at some length in the video that we will right. be sharing, but if you okay. could just distill that now for the yeah. audience. Yeah, yeah. So so there's a few points on that. Um, the See if you put up one of these cameras on a really sunny day, it would make an image in the paper in a single day, okay? And what it would show you if you've made a single pinhole in your camera is it would show you a picture of what's out there in the world, right? So if you point at a cathedral, you'll see the cathedral. But for every single day that the sun shines, you see a line that runs in an arc across the sky in the picture because that's that's the light burning in the image into the paper. Now, if you decide to go for a week, um, you'll get seven lines. A month, you'll get 30 lines. Um, so some people put those cameras up for as long as six months. Um, in my case, that wouldn't work too well because of Scotland having a lot of rain. Um, so I tend to do them for a month or two, max. Um, but what I'd also say is that 
I started out using a single pinhole so that I would get a fairly representative image. Um, but now I've moved away from that. And now I do multiple pinholes or I make slits in the aperture, which is really just a piece of aluminium uh, from a Coke can or iron brew can. Um, because I'm not so interested in making a conventional picture. I just want to see the marks that are made by the sun. And one of the things I find most interesting about the process is that I don't know what I'm going to get until I've processed the image at the end. And the way you process the image is you take it out of the pot um, after it's been up exposing for a month or two, and you quickly scan the image um, so that you get a digital file. And the, and the act of scanning itself actually destroys what was on the paper. Okay. I mentioned Sylvia Grace Border. She's actually on the, the Pacific coast. All oh, right. Um, similar weather to Scotland, wondering yeah. if moisture impacts the photo emulsion, but don't answer that right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, now there are, I just have to acknowledge a couple of questions, which hopefully Frank, you can go back to, uh, because we're going to bring this to an end very shortly. Right. Okay. No bother. Um, one is from uh, Robert Henderson. Does the process introduce a universal element as well as temporal, i.e. the sun? So you may want to think about that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Somebody named uh, Kate, who's uh, messaging through Duncan McLaren's... Um, right, yeah, and okay. Tell us more about your rebellion, Frank. <laughs> yeah, what? Rebellion. <laughs> um, so this is all great stuff. Um Martha McCulloch, who you met when you were over yeah. uh, in yeah. Ireland, has uh, come up with quite a good question here. Um, as someone who, with a practice that relies so much on purposeful wandering and travelling far and wide, how have you been coping with having to stay put? Oh, my have God. You been making work? Have you still been making work over the past few weeks? Apart from, you work through the day, you've actually, yeah. apart from this uh, highly productive uh, creative practice that you've got, yeah. Frank, you actually work yeah. uh, in a job as well, don't you? But anyway. I do, I do but listen, it's, yeah. a, it's a killer question because it made me realise this lockdown, just how much I'm an outdoor photographer and, you know, I miss it like hell, you know. Uh, I... And I, and I kind of, you know, think about doing wee projects in the house and, you know, your friends post images of things they've been photographing about the house, shadows and light and garden and stuff like that. And I just, I can't, <laughs> I haven't found a way yet that I could do that. Um, maybe I will, but I'm sorry to end on a negative, but uh, it, it just drives me mad. I want to be out in the world and traveling and, seeing meeting people and seeing you know places that i'm interested in uh just like i did when i was in ireland when i was in donegal that was uh an amazing place to visit and i want to go back so as soon as this thing's done and we're free again i'm definitely going to make a trip back to donegal 